social worker for West Midlands Teaching Partnership. I want to welcome you all to this research seminar, which is brought to you by the partnership. We are one of 27 accredited teaching partnerships in the country, and we bring together academics, practitioners, senior leaders and experts to strengthen the quality of social work, education, training and practice across the region. We have 27 partners, including HEIs, Children's Trust, local authorities and NHS Trusts. One of the areas we've been working on improving is social workers access to and understanding of research and supporting them to apply messages from research to their day to day practice. One way we hope to do this is by these seminars. Today we're joined by Peter Unwin from the University of Worcester and Alison Byrne, a foster carer with Liverpool Local Authority, who will be taking us through the research on experiences of disabled foster carers and helping us to understand how these messages can inform our practice. We normally have Joe McCormack from NICE um, attend these seminars as well, but unfortunately she's not been able to attend today's seminar. But there is a recording on our website uh, where Joe introduces NICE and um, the work that they do. And she would like me to emphasise that, you know, they can't um, do any guidance without research. So it's so important to their work. Um, but I'll pass over to um, Peter and Alison. Thanks very much, um, Joe. Uh, well, my name is Peter. I mean, I'll probably know some of you in the audience uh, from the time I've been around in uh, at the University of Worcester. And I did do one of these earlier, I think the first seminar in this series in, about my work with Gypsy Roma and Traveller communities, where there are big questions about foster care, kinship care. Um, that's perhaps a topic of a future one. But this this um, this piece of work is is uh, is to me far more than a novelty a lot of people have seen it as some kind of niche novelty i think it's an absolutely core issue which challenges our practice nationally and could be uh, in practical terms a solution to many of the problems of recruitment that we have across foster care agencies whether independent or statutory um, and one of the great regrets of my professional life is that despite some of the publicity we got for this including Alison and I starring on Women's Hour a year or so back. It really, and, and Coram Bath doing a practice note about it, kind of endorsing the realities of why we should have disabled people in the workforce. It hasn't taken off on any scale at all. And I put this down basically to lack of knowledge and indeed discrimination on behalf of uh, my colleagues, my fellow social workers and, and systems. So, I hope you'll find the um, uh, talk um, engaging and, and critical, and please be critical of the of the research, the findings, the um, analysis. Mainly, I'll take the lead talking. We'd like to work at the University of Worcester in co-production, and Alison, who is from Liverpool, as um, as Joe said, there very difficult to find local disabled people who are foster carers as well. So we had to go as far as Liverpool to find. Alison and I'll just let Alison introduce herself uh, briefly before we go on through the slides. Alison. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I've been fostering for Liverpool for um, seven years now. I currently have one um, permanent placement, um, one temporary time limited at the moment um, and um, that's about it. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, Alison, we, we'll also part way through the um, slides. We're going to show a, a video, 10 minutes worth of a video. I don't usually show videos on presentations, but I think this is a very good video. I would say that because I made it myself. Uh, I did do some of the film, actually. In fact, I filmed Alison in, in, up in, in Liverpool, but um, I think it's worth watching the 10 minutes of it because it illuminates the case um, from a variety of practitioner, a managerial and um, service user um, perspectives. Uh, and indeed, it features Alison as part of it. So when the film's played, um, we will we'll chat a bit more about the film itself. But uh, if we start with the slides, the title here, A Tale of Lost Opportunities is what we've called it, because I think it is a massive lost opportunity to the world of fostering, which, as you'll know, those of you in the um, audience, you'll know 
that issues of retention uh, and recruitment are, have been core across um, foster care for probably the last 20 years, really, and exacerbated in the last 10, 10 years. Fostering Network puts a range of numbers out every year, always in the 10,000 kind of mark of shortage of foster carers that we need to properly care and match our our children in terms of geography, um, needs, um, sibling groups, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I think the fact that we don't by and large recruit disabled people, many of whom of course are parents in their own right, to foster carers is a, a massive um, moral disgrace really and we should do far better than we do and as Alison with two children and she's got to rush off at quarter past three to I think a panto is it for the foster child if starring, a, yeah. starring in a first panto you know they are busy people and Alison as she'll she will see or she'll mention herself is a wheelchair user who manages to meet all of the requirements of fostering um, uh, and and organises her world, a very busy world, now she has two children around um, her disability. Can Thanks I, for, go on. Go can on, I Alison. just interrupt briefly and also yeah. one of the children I foster has a disability herself. Okay. Which is relevant in terms of um, appropriate role models. Right, very good point. Yeah. And um, you also have the benefit, of course, of Liverpool Council having a decent bus service with disabled friendly buses and they're fairly swift and the local taxi services are good so you know you manage to get around and meet all your um requirements as a contemporary uh, foster carer so we need lots more of allisons will be my our conclusion really so if we could move on to the next slide please adam uh, we did this work with a user-led organisation called Shaping Our Lives, uh, who've just had a, a conference. Indeed, I've just I've just had a Christmas dinner. So if I start nodding off halfway through, let me know. But I've just had a Christmas dinner, and here's my um, high quality hat look. How very professional! Um, with the service user group from the university, who were talking to me about the Shaping Our Lives network user con conference that just got held in Birmingham. So they're a user led group who basically lobby for a better deal for disabled people, uh, mainly across health and health and social care. And given the work we generally do at the university with disabled people and user groups. I got to know uh, Becky Meakin, who's a blind woman who is the chief executive of Shaping Our Lives. And we talked about doing some work together. And an opportunity came up to do some um, research together and um, she herself was kind of informally fostered as a child in the days when um, there wasn't too much regulation and whatnot or neighbours and friends took you in without any paperwork or social work involvement so she had a bit of a personal feel of being fostered um, and between us we identified this gap about why there are no disabled foster carers and she she led the training from the disabled person's point of view and to give you an example of some of the um, lack of knowledge um, maybe unconscious discrimination I remember we were in one one um, training session and um, a social worker of some years experience said to Becky well this is all very well and good you know in theory but how can a disabled person get to the training that they have to do these days and Becky said well have you noticed anything about me? And um, woman sort of paused a while and said, well, yes, you, you're blind. Um, she got very little sight, Becky, just sort of light and dark. And she said, yes, I'm a blind person. And what am I doing? Well, you're delivering the train. Oh, she sort of, you know, that kind of level of just not opening your mind up to think what can disabled people do? And this was quite an experienced social worker saying, they couldn't even get to training, totally missing the reality of she was being taught by a significantly disabled person. So we, we did this research in co-production with um, 
the user network, not that they could identify in their network of thousands of members any disabled foster carers. So we had to look um, around the, the country for um, agencies, local authority and private uh, and independent sector that had um, disabled people in their midst. So our, our um, research um, paradigm, the construct was to do this in co-production with disabled people. I did have in mind a disabled person I know in Worcestershire, who I've known as kind of a friend of the family for years, who I thought would be brilliant at this. And when I approached them, they, they said, um, we'd love to help you, Peter, but I'm really worried uh, that one partner was a couple, one was had a serious disability, the other person was not disabled. But I'm worried that if I do this and I start appearing in conferences and videos, then uh, I'll have my um, mobility car taken off me because the bureaucrats will say he can't be that disabled if he's kind of a leader of a movement to try and get disabled people as foster carers. So I was very shocked by this because as I tried to reassure him, you know, to say disability benefits or disability benefits are not going to be taken off you because you um, do this kind of work. You're actually doing this because you're the same. But he just, his, his paranoia, his fear, his anxiety was such that I couldn't, he, he didn't want to engage with the work for me. And as the research then proceeded and we went around the country or tried to go around the country, um, that that sentiment, that fear, in an overall atmosphere of, you know, all disabled people are scroungers and everybody's on benefits as a scrounger. It was a real inhibitor. And he was a person already in the system um, and had been in the system for some years. So he probably wasn't as disabled as he now is when he was recruited, say, 20 years ago. But that, that stuck with me, that sh kind of shocked me early on, opened my eyes to the... Um, um, the um, internal, the assimilated um, views of disabled people about what might it mean if I did kind of stick my head above the parapet and challenge this culture. So next step, next slide, please, um, Adam. So just a couple of uh, drier slides here, really, before we get into the real excitement. Um, uh, under the Equality Act 2010, if you have a physical or mental impairment that has substantial and long term negative effect on your ability to do normal daily activities. Now, that's a strange definition, isn't it? Uh, rather broad definition, rather than a tight definition. Uh, substantial and long term. Um, plenty of ground for argument there about quite what does negatively affect your ability. Um, there's a slight interference on the line i don't know if it's allison with a mic open uh, it might be allison but just just leave it off for now and come in as, as you will don't let it slow you down coming in yeah um next slide then please adam so substantial means more than minor or trivial for example it takes much longer than it usually would to complete a daily task like getting dressed long term means 12 months or more rather than a temporary condition, uh, broken leg or whatever. There are special rules about recurring or fluctuating conditions, e.g. arthritis. People with progressive conditions could be uh, classed as uh, disabled. And if you've got uh, an HIV diagnosis, cancer or multiple sclerosis, you automatically meet the definition of um, being disabled. And um, Contentiously, you know, uh, alcohol, substance, substance issues, addictions are excluded from the definition. And, and I put this slide up really because the other thing that surprised me, particularly as I'm somebody who trained in the days of generic social work. So we used to have mixed case loads of older people, disabled people, mental health uh, issues, children, adoption. We had a real cornucopia of different challenges. We knew we tended to informally specialise, but, but we had a broad grasp of, of the communities in which we worked. But one of the things that struck me as we went round the sites where we um, uh, had our focus, the ones who come forward to want to be involved, was, was how little 
um, children's uh, uh, fostering social workers, how little experience, knowledge, comfortability they had in working with disabled adults. Um, because they had, for example, maybe done a statutory um, children's placement for their second social work qualifying placement. They'd gone straight into a children's team, probably then straight to a foster team as their next move. So they never really worked with disabled adults. And there was a lot of anxiety around about well, you know, what words should we use? What if we say the wrong thing? That kind of hesitancy that some of the wokeness, the political correctness has, has brought our way. Um, so that was a, a surprising finding to, to me about how uncomfortable, I think it's probably a fair word to use, many um, current social workers in foster, fostering teams and children's teams, albeit our focus was on fostering teams, but clearly it's no good fostering teams saying, yes, we're going to open our doors and be welcoming and encouraging and scaffold um, disabled people in our midst if the children's teams won't place uh, with them because they're disabled. I know that sounds bizarre to be saying in a, a social work profession, but those kind of um, unsaid realities, uh, the subconscious and sometimes the... Um, sometimes actually said, well, why would I place with a disabled person when I've got a, a non-disabled person to place with? As if it's a lesser offer rather than a different offer. And I think you'll see on the film, um, Carrie from Match Independent Foster Agency in Droit, which Worcestershire, she says something like towards the end of the film, we, 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 we get the same from our, we, we get the same output as it were they're just as they're equally as good as foster carers as people who aren't disabled we do not see them as a lesser um provision um you know like a reserve choice as it were um although she, she does also say that you know we do do a bit more than we would do perhaps on certain help with transport and whatnot but essentially um they're in her um organization there they are a proven uh resource who have to meet the same standards as everybody who is currently registered who is not a disabled person. So next slide please Adam. Some kind of um, broad statistics then. The percentage of disabled people has stayed um, about um, similar, similar about about twenty percent of the population have some kind of uh, disability, and you'll know that they can be hidden disabilities. There is a whole spectrum from um, you know slight disabilities through to disabilities that would uh, you know rank as seriously impairing them um, ability to conduct everyday life. And and we we. We have had, and I've had several calls since we did this research, which finished in 2020, um, just before COVID, this finished, um, the actual piece of exploratory research finished. We, we hope the mission hasn't finished, although, as I said in the preamble, it hasn't taken off um, as I hoped it might have done. Um, we, I have had a, some calls from people with very, very significant disabilities. I think of one person who had a team of carers 24-7 for her needs and she'd been um, trying to uh, kinship care, it was a kinship situation for a teenager who'd chosen to stay with her and she then applied and the advice from um, most disabled people was no, you couldn't do that and there's clearly issues about privacy isn't there and police checks and um, numbers of people coming through, the, through the, but, but in the end to my surprise the agency in question did approve that person as a kinship carer. And I think the teenage teenager was about 15 and they'd clearly said, we're going to stay here. And as far as I know, they have stayed there. Equally, I've been asked to intervene in as like an advocate in other cases where I've felt that the people who've come to me because they've seen this video on YouTube or whatever, have had a very raw deal and they've been um, discriminated against, essentially because um, they've declared sometimes a, a mental health uh, problem from some years back or a physical disability that um, that they were almost, and as Alison says on the, on the slide, on the film, 
and may embellish later, often these people are turned down as soon as they mention disability or I'll ring you back or somebody will visit and they don't. Um, so it's um, it, it, it is a real problem in our midst, particularly for a profession who espouses you know, equality of opportunity, values, uh, respect, self-determination, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to have not, that message has not been translated into uh, the reality of uh, contemporary fostering in England. And Alison mentioned earlier there, the role modelling. Um, you know, some people have interpreted this research as, oh, so you're looking for disabled people to foster disabled children, are you? So, well, no, we'd be looking for disabled people to be foster carers. If they can also foster disabled children because they have uh, extra empathy or they can offer a role model of somebody in a positive and socially valued role um, then that's great but but we're the mission really was to find foster carers for foster children not specifically for uh, disabled children so the, the main problems people who have um, disability uh, is uh, mobility and back problems uh, one in 20 children have some kind of disability, one in seven working age adults and in retirement age, whenever it is now, it keeps going up, doesn't it? Uh, one in two have some kind of significant issues. And I expected another thing that surprised me in the research we did. I expected to find in kinship carers quite a few issues because I'd heard of these anecdotally before we started research, whereby older grandparents had been turned down because, you know, there'd been a heart problem or there'd been a, a stroke X years ago uh, or what have you. Um, I expected to find quite a lot of disabledist and ageist stories. But unfortunately, despite contacting um, Kinship UK and going to a conference and we didn't really get any interest from kinship carers and even in the local authorities we work with, um, you know, we work with a range of local authorities and um, independents. They they didn't come up with any people with significant disability issues who they'd approved. And they didn't particularly have the organisational memory as to whether they'd in fact turned X number down over, over recent years. So that was a surprising finding. I, I expected to find, and I say I had heard anecdotally of the difficulties some grandparents in particular had had if they when they applied um you know again i fully understand if you're late 70s 80 and you want to adopt a newborn then i could understand why that may not be appropriate but where you're talking older children people in the 60s and 70s wanting to foster them i just don't really get it um so the welfare reform over the years that has taken from disabled people, disabled people generally do worse than people not disabled in terms of um, employability. The gap there, something like 30 percent harder to get in employment if you're you're disabled and not disabled. And some of you know about the dilemmas of do I, do I declare that I've got an epileptic condition? Do I declare that I've got I've had depression? Do I declare I'm on whatever I'm on? And, and then not get the job or do I get the job and then I'm so anxious that those conditions flare up or whatnot. A real double bind that, that shouldn't exist. And the issue of poverty, very much up the social worker agenda now. Uh, BASRA are doing a lot on anti-poverty. I'm a member of the BASRA anti-austerity group with service users trying to get a better deal for disabled people. Um, and in terms of, you know, heating rooms and what have you. It's clearly when you're not that mobile, those issues impact far more on disabled people than on people who are not disabled. So, you know, a person in the street might say, oh, yeah, things are a lot more equal now. You know, you can get access to buildings. Disabled people get good benefits and a good deal. That is not generally the lived experience of people dealing with benefit systems and um, and bureaucracies and the private sector in, indeed. Uh, prejudice in the discriminating against disabled people is still alive and well and i would suggest um, radically that it is alive and well within the world of foster care i might add i've worked in in children's teams i've been a foster carer i was a foster carer for a local authority with my wife for some five or so years so i i do also have that inside um, 
you. I've been um, a chair of um, panels, foster panels, and I've also done a fair bit of investigative work in complaints in foster care for um, foster talk. So I've got a fair few perspectives on the contemporary world of of fostering. Um, obviously, a lot richer now than people like Alison and understood some of the real dynamics around disability dis disability and fostering. So next slide, Adam, I think might be the this it's the film. Yeah. So we call this mutual benefits as opposed to friends with benefits, which I'm told by my younger colleagues is something completely different. Um, and we call it mutual benefits because we do think this is like a you know cliche win win, a win for disabled people to get them into valued uh, paid roles, a win for uh, the authorities because it'll um, help your retention and recruitment, and hopefully win for children because you'll have more choice nearer to your home, um, and hopefully more appropriate placements will become available if we tap this. On met resource. So, having kind of told you what the key theories are, we're going to play this 10 minute film and then we'll have a discussion. Of, well, no, we won't have a discussion afterwards because we record these things. I, I'll ask Alison to perhaps embellish, highlight, illuminate any issues uh, she picks up from seeing the film again. And you might want to use the chat function to make any, any comments. So, and I'll, I'll, ask Adam to stop the film at about 10 minutes. So if if we could roll them, as they say, Adam. Yeah, no problem. Can you just let me know if you can hear it when I press play? The sound might have disabled. Let me just check. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah. Right. I could hear it. This video is called Mutual Benefits, the potential of disabled. Absolutely. My microphone off mute button. People as foster carers. And the first person to speak is Dr. Peter Unwin, Principal Lecturer from the University of Worcester. My name is Peter Unwin. I'm a Principal Lecturer at the University of Worcester. And I was very pleased to be involved in this research project with colleagues from Shaping Our Lives Disability Network and the Foster Care Cooperative. We applied for big lottery mo money through um, Drill and we made a case that there was a missing voice in foster care of disabled people and we wondered why this was so particularly as fostering has in recent years uh, become much more diverse and recruited people from different backgrounds in terms of ethnicity and sexuality but um, again despite the fact that many disabled people are themselves parents we hardly could think of a disabled person acting as a foster carer and we hope that um, the film that follows will illuminate the voice of disabled people and point to, the, to a future where we'll see disabled people included as foster carers alongside everybody else from all walks of life. The next person to speak is Becky Meakin, General Manager at Shaping Our Lives Service User and Disabled Persons Network. When we started looking at um, disabled people and their potential to become foster carers, um, we realised very quickly that there were very few disabled people in the fostering workforce. So I think it's partly because disabled people have not appreciated that they um, are equally, if not um, in some cases, more qualified to enter into the fostering workforce. Um, than other people, but also because the agencies have not been um, as inclusive in their practice as they should have been to enable disabled people to feel comfortable and confident about approaching. The following interviews feature disabled people who work as foster carers and their support staff. The first person you'll hear speak will be Alison foster carer for Liverpool City Council. So um, I became interested in fostering following um, some voluntary work that I did. Um, so first of all, I approached um, three different agencies originally um, and was turned down um, almost straight away by them due to being a wheelchair user. Um, so I actually left 
it a while before um, trying something else um, and approached Liverpool City Council. Um, luckily, Liverpool City Council were quite different um, and positive about what I could offer to a looked after child. Um, so I went through the recruitment process with them, um, which was quite supportive and positive again. Um, so I got approved as a foster carer three years ago now. Um, I began my role with two easier placements, perhaps with younger children, um, and they were short term. I now have um, a child who was considered very difficult to place um, and was about to be placed out of the Liverpool area due to extreme behaviours and her own special needs. Um, she's now been with me over two years, is placed with me permanently um, and is doing fantastically well. She's turned around her behaviours, she's settled in school, she's doing well out of school with her interests and hobbies um, and it's just um, really worked for both of us. The next person you'll hear speak is John Pelton, foster carer for the National Fostering Agency. How long have you been a foster carer? Uh, just eight years. Eight years and three weeks. And how do you think your disability has affected you working as a foster carer? Uh, it, it puts limitations on me. It, I, and, you know, you, do, you always manage limitations. I don't think it affects what I do. It affects in some ways the things I can do. Um, you know, I can't necessarily run around the park and play football with the children, but what I can do is facilitate them going to the park and playing football, or I can take them to football coaching. And I can... So I don't think it really affects what I do in any way. I don't allow it to. Okay. And how did the foster agencies you originally approached view your disability? A little bit mixed, actually. Um, the first one outright rejected me. Um, in terms of, without doing any assessment rejecting me, without coming and even speaking to me or looking at me or meeting me or seeing what my capabilities were, outright rejected me. Right. Um, a local authority didn't really engage. Um, so it's been a little bit mixed, you know, I, I came to a different a different path into fostering through a different agency where it were marvellous, so it's a little bit mixed. The next person to speak will be Ian Owens, Supervising Social Worker for the National Fostering Agency Group. And have you made any adjustments in your organisation for uh, working with John, who I believe has a disability? Uh, yeah, we have. So we've looked at the, the, the training venues as one example um, that we use across the, um, the area where John lives um, to, to try and make them accessible wherever possible. And we've, that's led to moving a few venues um, so it's easier access for people. We're looking at the terminology we use on the website as well, um, looking at the case studies we use to try and promote to people um, that, that fostering is a, is a possibility for, for people with disabilities. The next person speaking will be Linda from the Oldham Council Fostering Service. I've been a foster carer for 28 years and I lost my sight six years ago, literally overnight. Um, I've not lost all my sight. I'm severely sight impaired, so it has allowed me to carry on fostering. Um, I've had to make quite a few changes to the way that I foster and the ages that I foster. Um, obviously, because I can't run around after the toddlers like I used to do, um, can't keep them safe in the park and things. Uh, with the babies, it makes a difference in the way that I make the bottles up. I bought a special kettle that only pours one lot of water out at a time into a bottle so I don't burn myself. I buy bottles that have got quite dark markings on so I can see the measurements. And it seems a bit silly, but I'm very careful what clothes I buy because of buttoning the buttons up. And I've had babies with poppers here, there and everywhere and almost back to front but they don't mind. Um, I'm not as good at being outside as I used to be at taking babies for walks, but I've got a very good family and we tend to do it all together. Now, Lisa Lawson, recruitment officer from Oldham Council Fostering Services, will give her views about recruiting disabled people. 
As part of the research project, we launched a marketing campaign aimed at targeting disabled people direct and getting them to think about um, becoming foster carers. Uh, to do this, we used a variety of, of imagery. Um, the main one we used was um, disabled, and we emphasised able in the wording, just to say that we saw the potential in people who live with a disability. Um, we also had a second set of artwork, which is disability, which again emphasised the ability. Um, and it was just basically challenging disabled people's perceptions and getting them to think what they can do and what, what instead of what they can't do and ruling themselves out. Um, we feel it's worked quite well and um, it's very much an ongoing campaign really what we're going to do over the next few years. Next to speak will be Gail Granger, Supervising Social Worker for the Foster Care Cooperative. I think our general awareness of uh, people with disabilities and what they can bring to fostering has really increased through uh, the project. Uh, so that's sort of generally the, the, the social workers that are involved and also the management so that we can look at assessments in a much more kind of favourable light. Practically, uh, we've looked at our premises and we've actually um, introduced uh, something to help on the IT front for people that perhaps have trouble accessing um, uh, computer web pages. So we've uh, introduced an access button that would help them to do that. The next speaker is Carrie Marsh, Managing Director of Match Foster Care. We, we recognise we're just at the start of this project, but already we have recruited foster carers who have disabilities. Um, they offer no lesser service to the children that they're caring for than our foster carers who don't have disabilities. In fact, what we found is that in a lot of cases, people who've lived with a disability all their lives have a level of resilience that maybe others don't. We've got foster carers who don't drive and we're willing to put lots and lots of practical support into get, helping them get around. And we have disabled foster carers who can do that independently. So what we're looking for is people who are nurturing and loving and can keep children safe and we will fill the gaps where needed. We will now return to hear some more comments from John Pelton, foster carer for the National Fostering Agency. So why then do you think there are so few disabled foster carers in the workforce? I think it's lack of engagement to be fair. I think that over the years there's been there's a reluctance for agencies and local authorities to engage with disabled people. I think there's just it's just not happened yet. I think there's such a massive potential for people with disabilities to change fostering to be a massive positive impact on it. They've just not been engaged with, I think, through fear or through lack of lack of resources or many options. But I think there's definitely a massive there's a massive market of people, there. there's a massive pool of talent there that could make a massive impact on fostering. There is now a slide stating the conclusions of the mutual benefits study. Point number one, positive examples of disabled foster carers have been found. Point number two, disabled foster carers have proved effective and resilient. Point number three, discriminatory attitudes exist among professionals. Point number four, deaf and disabled people's organizations have not been proactive in this study. Point number five, there is much confusion about benefits or access to work eligibility. Point number six, there are no national guidelines about recruiting or retaining disabled foster carers. Point number seven, fostering agencies are missing large scale opportunities for recruitment. The next slide is entitled, what needs to be done in the future? Point one, there needs to be effective reach out to disabled people and their organizations. Point two, fostering professionals need training in disabled issues such as social model of disability, benefits issues, and the use of outside resources. Point three, disabled foster carers need to be championed by their agencies. Point four, there needs to be monitoring and recording of disabled applicants and the number of conversions to becoming foster carers. Point five, a best practice guide needs to be produced. And finally, point six, there needs to be a national rollout of these findings tracking progress from first point of inquiry. Okay, folks, um, 
just a couple of updates on that, then I'll I'm ask um, Alison to put a mic on and, and, and comment on whatever's changed since since that bit of work done in her situation and elsewhere. But I, I didn't mention the foster care cooperative. I should have done really. We did bid for this money, which was big lottery money, with uh, shaping our lives and foster care cooperative. Uh, lots of funders now like universities to work with uh, people in the field and foster care cooperative or one of the few who came forward the only cooperative model in fostering in the uk and they um help keep our feet on the ground perhaps really in terms of what's um realistic and what not um and there has been a practice guide uh, developed since which we'll mention and on on the sadder side of things um, John Powton, who's been a massive champion of this, he was solo champion in this issue for some years until this piece of research came along. Um, he um, sadly died of cancer just a couple of months back. Um, so we're a big loss, John. Um, a big advocate for Duchenne's, which I think is a form of mus muscular dystrophy. So he was uh, banging the drum not only for um, disabled people in general, but he had a he had a long and productive um career and people like John and Allison and Linda are exceptional people but the contention of the research is that they shouldn't be exceptional people they should be everyday people who get equality of opportunity to foster they shouldn't have the need to be knocked down two or three times when they apply to foster and get back up again um, you know that they shouldn't need to be that resilient uh, doors should open for them far more easily than, than than they than they have done. So Alison, would you like to add any comments to um you know your take on seeing the film again in its in its totality, you know, things that have changed in your situation or problems you've had, joys you've had? Yeah, um could I just make a general point first? Sure. Um, that came across a little bit in the film um about resilience and finding ways around things and um different ways of doing things and the idea of not giving up easily all those qualities which disabled people have to develop in themselves are qualities that you would need um, a looked after child to be developing so surely that gives disabled people a bit of extra um to offer a child who's looked after Um, to give more information about my story, um, the child I currently have permanently, um, it said in the video she was due to be placed elsewhere. That would have been um, residential care, I believe. Um, she wasn't likely to have the same opportunities she does now. Um, she's settled really well in placement. Um, she's just moved on to secondary school, well, a couple of years ago now, time flies, um, and she's progressing really well in a secondary school that nobody thought she would have been able to go to. Um, she attends an orchestra. Um, she has done theatre work in London um, and is doing a pantomime at Christmas. She sees her family regularly because she's still based in Liverpool. Um, she has contact with friends who um, were there from the beginning of her placement again because she lives still close to where she lived before. Um, so she's got all the benefits from that. Um, and just generally, um, as my social worker says, um, it's been life changing for her, um, but also for me. Um, it's made a big difference to my confidence and the fact that I've still got something to offer now that I wouldn't necessarily have had. Um, as well as fostering, I do um, some work around publicity to recruit more foster carers now, so I've got that aspect. Um, and um, we moved house six months ago, so I've now got a second placement as well, just to keep me busy. Yeah. Okay, is that Alison from you? Um, yeah. Yes, I think That's so. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, 
if we could take the next slide that comes after the film, please, Adam. It looks like that's the next one on my one there, Peter, the disability and foster care. Yeah, OK, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so as that film has hopefully illum illuminated, there is no culture within fostering, which includes disabled people as foster carers, uh, role models. I don't think I'll put the numbers on the next film, but essentially when we started this project, we wrote to every local authority and independent agency in the country. From recall, I think that was about 400. Uh, and we got less than 20 responses, just really saying, are you interested in possibly moving this forward? You know, it could be a win-win, be it the cutting edge of research. And we got about 20 replies back. Um, some thanks, but no thanks. The, the one that sticks in my mind on the negative side of the replies was we'd love to help this is a great idea but our office is upstairs so sorry we can't help so i don't know if that person put that down in their social work england cpd as an example of creative thinking but that's just indicative to me of some of the straight jacketed thinking the cul-de-sac thinking around disabled people and the image that occurs. I mean, Alison happens to be a wheelchair user. Most disabled people aren't wheelchair users. Um, um, so we, we got we got very few replies and then of the 15 or so who were positive, we ended up, I think, recruiting it was five. Um, unfortunately, no local interest, no regional interest. Not that we had the magic of the social work partnership then. This was before the partnership really came into being or just as it was coming into being, because I think the partnership depending what comes out of days like this, it may be that we could have a push within the partnership where all our fostering colleagues struggle with recruitment. We could perhaps have a, a drive and some more research, some more funding, some pilot projects or whatever um, to try and change this culture using the, using the sort of collegiality, the mutual, the mutual benefits of, of, the, of, the, of the partnership. But, it's, but essentially, the reality appears that unlike the, the significant steps that have been made in fostering in recent decades in reaching out to uh, different um, ethnic minorities, uh, not as far as maybe we should have done, but trying, you know, trying to make it less white middle class occupation um, and people with different sexualities who, you know, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have been uh, proven as foster carers, it's now mainstreamed. Um, the bit about benefits is a biggie, but all the research we did, and we went down to the DWP in London, uh, Becky and myself and uh, 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 her support worker uh, to meet the DWP about this. And much as they wouldn't commit anything to writing, of course, their strong view and our reading around the country is that disability benefits don't, disappear if your income goes up that you get those because you're disabled um, if you're on universal credit uh, various others like job seekers there are or as it changes all the time many social works of course and i don't mean this as a criticism but i probably do in a way but i can see why it's so they're not expert many of us aren't expert in the ever-changing uh, landscape of benefits so uh, you know we don't really know enough perhaps and we don't have those links with our local benefits office in the sort of dehumanizing of these services um you know we don't really know where to get good best honest advice from and, and the court and it still seems to be the that there's an idiosyncratic culture in benefits offices whereas you know an office in bromsgrove might take a quite different view to one in Malvern and take a different one to one in solihull a different one to one in coventry there seems to be a lot of local interpretation of what's allowable in terms of what you can earn without affecting this benefit and that benefit. So that's a whole world in itself. But the general message we got, and everybody we talked to who was a disabled foster carer, and we probably spoke to eight or 10 people, uh, and you say featured three of them in the, in the film, uh, none of them had had their disability related benefits affected by earning a fees as a, a foster carer. Um, but as you'll know, those of you 
um, well, you're all in the world of fostering, I think there may be some people who are more on the edges of fostering listening, but the fostering is not a guaranteed income. Um, there's hardly an agency in the country that offers a salary. So the fluctuating nature of income is such that uh, maybe people who have mortgages or rent or um, other outgoings, you know, they're not particularly that comfortable financially. They haven't got the buffer of a load of savings or whatnot. Uh, they're very um, vulnerable in terms of these, you know, I've earned a couple of grand one month and nothing the next because children have moved on, hopefully positively. So that inconsistency of income does make it problematic, uh, particularly if you were somebody, well, not necessarily even dis a disabled person, a person on benefits who had to go back on benefits because the rigmarole of getting back benefits once you've lost them, I'm not talking disabled benefits, um, it, it's very difficult. You know, the system is punitive. Uh, you know, those of you who've watched Ken Loach's films um, will know all about the benefit system. And I think that the um, those realities, as well as that fear of losing benefits and not getting them back and getting in financial trouble, is a real spectre. Um, but I wouldn't have thought it was beyond the ken of certain authorities and maybe independent agencies who have more flexibility, more resource to have come up with schemes that are better guaranteed. If you commit to us as a carer, we will guarantee you a certain level of income. You will not be homeless. You will not, not be able to feed yourself if we are not able to supply you with appropriate children over the next year or whatever, without being too pie in the sky about it. I'm sure if we had the will to do this, and again, that might be the kind of thing we could do as a pilot project, you know, put a few grand into this and, and guarantee some in, in, income support if necessary and see what that did in terms of recruitment um, dynamics. Um, but that is a real problem. Um, and also, of course, not that many disabled people have a spare room. And uh, we all know about the bedroom tax and, and, and such. But again, Liverpool Council, who've been very cooperative from day one, not just Alison, clearly we went through their management and their system, they've been excellent. Um, and until I phoned Alison a couple of months ago about this session, I didn't know she was taking on a second child. I didn't know she'd moved. So, and I imagine, Alison, the, the council have helped you find the second property, have they? And they've been... They've been, yeah, they've they've, been, they've been very supportive and very encouraging all the way through. Um, yeah. And I feel like um, I wouldn't be worried um, about a lack of placements because... There's so many, so much need for placements that um, I've proved I'm a good foster carer, then um, why shouldn't I get them in the same way that everybody else does? Yeah, yeah, but you've, you've got a track record now, though. If, I think yeah. you said two years on the video, but it's probably four or five now, isn't it? Um, five, yeah. Five with his At child, least. seven yeah. years fostering yeah. or whatnot. So, yeah. so you're kind of in the system. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but I don't know, but I, I'm presuming that the council somehow helped you acquire the, the new house yes. so you could foster you could foster from it with a separate bedroom yeah yes yeah, yeah okay good i'm sure that other other agencies do that but it just struck me in liverpool who are not the richest council in the world in fact they're probably one of the poorest seem able to put priority in in in, in this area um so next slide please um adam so on on the on the reasons we bid for this research project in, initially was that issue about um, a better choice of placements from these you know uh, potential hundreds of thousands of foster care, uh, people out there who are disabled who are parents who could be foster carers. The, the thing we mentioned there that Alison illuminated about foster children and positive role models um, clearly. Um, being true to our avowed philosophy, values of, of social work in terms of offering genuine equal opportunity to disabled people rather than treating them as a lesser, a lesser offer. And also on a kind of um, pragmatic uh, view, which is part of the reason I think being realistic, we got the funding. Uh, the government liked the idea, and I think many disabled people like the idea of being able to get into valued work and not be as reliant on benefits and um, you know there are these 
targets that government after government set down there, then they abandon. Um, you know, the, the uh, Labour were going to get rid of poverty, child poverty by 2020. But it's now 2022 and it's a damn sight worse. And this one here, the old party parliamentary group on disability, 2016, wanted to halve the unemployment gap, that, that disparity. But of course, it hasn't happened, even in a time of pretty much full employment, albeit as the politically minded amongst you, which I hope is you all, will know what employment sometimes means these days. It's about zero contracts, minimum pay, lack of um, you know conditions for service and what have you. So we were kind of morally driven by the idea of um, raising the positive model of disability, the social model, um, and seeing disabled people as, as assets to you as a foster agent rather than a liability, you know, an insurance risk, a transport risk, a health and safety risk. Uh, uh, medicals were an interesting debate. I don't, don't think I've got a particular slide on this for this presentation about people getting turned down because they couldn't get down on the floor and blow up Rissociani or whatever she's called these days. Um, whereas the real advice is that that's not necessary. Uh, the idea that you have to be fully first aid competent. The the key measure is that if a child's in an emergency situation, you need to know how to dial 999. Alison, do you want to come in on that? Yes, please. Just from a medical perspective, um, the medicals for foster carers, I've experienced some discrimination there, really, because I've never actually passed a medical <laughs> purely on grounds of being a wheelchair user. And luckily, Liverpool City Council have been open minded enough to disregard it yeah. and, and been able to do that. But that could have been a huge stumbling block for me. So I'm still considered not fit, not medically fit to be a foster carer, even though I've done it consistently now for five years. Well, there you are then. There's an outrage in itself, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um... And and again, the thing that surprised me in doing the research, and I think one woman that we worked with who had did apply, actually, she she applied. She saw in the paper that, that we were doing this bit of research and she said, oh, I'm disabled and I want to apply to foster. And the idea was that we would follow her journey through. But unfortunately, her journey never got really off the ground because she was blocked at really every step about um, her her condition she had a mental health background as well as some physical mobility issues i knew her through a member of a voluntary organization where she performed very well known for some years but she didn't get past what i just saw as as discrimination really and um just in the end it, it wore her out really uh she she challenged it a couple of times i think and put a complaint in and all that, but she didn't get anywhere. And really, she felt this is getting me down. I only wanted to help foster. I didn't want to go through the mill and be going to panels and appealing and whatnot, when really all I want is equal opportunity to prove myself. So unfortunately, what we hope might be a, a longer story was a very short and negative story um, in, in, in this locality. Um, so next slide, please, Adam. Right, so four pilot sites we had. Oh yeah, that was an interesting one. We One we recruited, it was in the independent sector uh, in the south of the country. They were the first one who came forward. Excellent people, uh, very proactive. Um, hadn't actually got any disabled people, but could see the sense of the project. But then what happened is happens in the world of independent social uh, foster care agencies. They got taken over by some other bigger business. Uh, fostering, who initially had told the champions who we signed up with that they would um, participate in the research. And almost the minute they got the job, I remember a most officious discussion with a woman on the phone saying, well, unless the contract says we have to do this, we're not doing it. So if you want to talk to our legal department or some kind of hideous conversation like that, uh, they're basically saying there's no money in this for us. Um, why would we want to be uh, recruiting disabled people and working with the university? Um, so that was an um, upsetting little episode, but in some ways it also underlined the reality of 
the messages that that we um we kind of brought together around this 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 topic. Um, it was laborious getting access. I mentioned the survey before. How few answers we got it can be a bit disheartening. Um, we did an audit of websites. How many online uh, agencies in Britain had a role model of uh, a disabled person as a you know come and foster for us this is Jenny she's a disabled person or Fred or whoever and and the only one we could find where it was anywhere findable on the website was Liverpool and that's in fact how we got Alison um, the only uh, one hopes there's more now but there'll only be a handful now generally it'll be um, well there's one or two agencies who've used stock you know shutter stock type um off the peg false pictures of disabled people who aren't actually their carers uh to say um to give some presence to that element of diversity uh but so the role models aren't there if you were a disabled person who was a bit hesitant to ring a foster agency or apply there's no role models there uh, by and large the case studies you'll sometimes read on these websites will hardly ever mention, they'll often mention um, sexualities or example of somebody from an ethnic minority, they won't mention uh, disabled people. And that's such a quick win just to do that. Um, I've mentioned the medicals, um, first aid, um, benefits, I've mentioned those, lack of case studies. Yeah, and um, the, the video mentioned this, again, I didn't mention it much in the preamble, but the idea was that we would work particularly through shaping our life who have who are a you know nationally respected high profile disabled group we would work with them to get the deaf and disabled people's organizations which are primarily the user led rather than what i call the great and the good disability organizations led by dignitaries we would get them to enthuse their own members and say look we're we're opening doors here's new new career possibilities for you but they didn't really engage. We had a very poor take up. Um, and we also found, and I'm going to sound ages here and argue against what I was saying earlier, but we did find that a lot of the people who went to disability groups were themselves in their 60s, 70s, 80s, rather than perhaps their 20s, 30s and 40s. And we had a few little efforts at trying to engage various disability sports groups, sports organisations where younger in this university Worcester we have a very active disabled sports um, profile uh, nationally and internationally actually uh, basketball in particular um, but we never really got any bites I can't pretend we had lots of money to push all that but we did try and look and the spark for that was actually Becky Meekin herself who, who picked up that most of these disabled groups were probably of the older age cohorts and not really looking for opportunities like fostering, which are challenging. Um, she said, well, I go to a blind swimming club every Friday or whatever. It's great fun, she says. We we bump into each other and hit each other in the face and nobody complains. You're in my lane or whatever because we're all blind. So she she's very uh, witty and very insightful and said, they're the kind of people we want to be reaching out to people, Peter. Lots of them are young mums, um, you know, primary school kids, secondary school kids. But we've not comprehensively done that. Uh, perhaps we would do that as a late, later push, particularly if we could get more sign up from fostering agencies. Because, again, it's no good us putting all our eggs in the basket of disabled sports groups, you know, as well as running a marathon, come and foster a child when foster agencies aren't going to facilitate that. They're, in fact, going to shut the door on you. Yeah. So a difficult topic, but we can discuss that probably in a minute or two. Uh, next slide, then, please. Adam, um, yeah, we did a, a training survey. Lots of people uh, gave reasons why people could not become foster carers, largely because of cogn cognitive mobility, communication and mental health issues. Um, and again, that is the, the, all those are on a spectrum, aren't they? We've all had mental health issues. We've all had difficulties. We've all had illnesses. You know, that's on the human spectrum of the problems in living. The safeguarding, if your disability means you couldn't meet, then that's fair enough, isn't it? If a child was maybe, I don't know, particular self-harmer and used to lock themselves in the bedroom regularly and you had to run up there quickly. And, you know, there must be some cases where the match, the matching, the key, that holy grail of fostering is it, matching. 
Yeah. Um, there would clearly be some, but then there's exceptions in other people that you approve as foster carers. You know, there's children I wouldn't have been up to looking after when I was approved as a foster carer. It's not my skill set. Um, but clearly safeguard is still paramount. The, the reason for this mission is not primarily to um, help disabled people have a fuller life. The real focus is on having helping children have a fuller life. The, the spin-off of that is to enhance, as, as Alison just articulated, to enhance uh, their uh, disabled people's own sense of well-being and purpose. Um, and on the positive side, many staff did recognise that, well, yes, disabled people do go through a lot, don't they, and do have to plan things and do have their own children, many of them, yeah? Next slide, please, Adam. Um, just over half felt confident about talking with disabled people. The point I made earlier about it wasn't their background, mainly social workers that only work with children. 30% of respondents thought they could make things accessible. They understood what was out there. 25%, only a quarter felt confident about dealing with mental health issues. It wasn't again in their comfort zone. And the issues about access, about benefits, about, you know, medicals and discretion, only a quarter of people were confident in that area. So low levels of confidence in this area. Most people, this is more an academic thing, co-production, genuinely working with people who are disabled or use services as partners to try and get a better grasp of the issues rather than academics or professionals having the hierarchy in the, in the who, who knows best stakes, respecting views of lived experience. Look at Linda there, woman who lost her sight and said, look, I can't foster toddlers anymore because I can't chase them across the road, but I could foster babies or teenagers, despite my sight issues. You know, great co-production, thinking together, planning, sorting out problems together, rather than, as would have happened to many people who lost their sight overnight, fostering, they would no longer have been able to foster. So all credit to Oldham in this case, yeah? And very little knowledge about the Equality Act and rights, and a fear about, I might say the wrong thing, I might, um, you know, unwittingly discriminate against somebody, then I'll be in trouble. And then there'll be an inquiry and blood, you know, that defensive cloud that sits on all our shoulders as social workers. So next one, please, Adam. Um, after the training that Becky did, there was um, evidence of better understanding of benefits of definitions of disability uh, in the in the well, the three areas we ended up doing the training, the three uh, authorities or two two authorities, local authorities, and one private um, setting. Um, lessening the anxiety about working with disabled people and hopefully a more positive, well, they, they as they fed feedback after the training sessions, uh, better understanding of disabled people as assets rather than disability, uh, liabilities. Um, Adam, next one, please. Um, and in those areas, those three areas, you know, it's just three out of 400, remember, um, evidence of active support of applications. Um, they did host some specific events. You know, if you're disabled, come along for, a bit like um, the campaign that Linda showed from Oldham, uh, proactive, not using phrases on the website like fully fit and healthy. You know, if you're a disabled person, fully fit or I'll never get past the interview or whatever they think it is. What does fully fit and healthy mean? You know, does it mean you've got to run 100 yards in 20 seconds or whatever it is, or never have an illness or not be a bit of asthma or what have you? What does that mean, that phrase? You know, get rid of it. And so you have to be able to meet the needs of children. Um, more interpretation around um, medicals, first aid training, less dogmatic about what you have to do, making reasonable adjustments. You might know that phrase from the Equality Act, making reasonable adjustments to engage a disabled person. Um, and general, they're going to take on more training of the staff or so they say. We'll have to follow it up, won't we? Next one, please, um, Adam. So the areas we still need to do work in then, Professional attitude, great you've invited us here today because we haven't had many invites to talk about this topic since we did it. Um, we welcome your ideas. 
and maybe we could get something going in the partnership. Um, we teach this obviously on Worcester University now because I'm here. Most unis won't, they'll teach about fostering, but not about disability fostering. Ofsted were good, I must say. Um, and they have, uh, they invited us to talk to them. They've accepted that they've missed this in their own scrutiny of diversity and fostering. And I understand because I was told by um, somebody from an agency that from I think next year, or 2023, I think, they are, they are going to in their inspections and we all jump at inspections, don't we? They are going to have a a tick box or section asking about how many disabled foster carers you've got or what you're trying to do to recruit them. So I'm told, I have not that confirmed, but they did promise they'd do that when we met them. So I hope they have done that because that itself could be a good, a good um, culture mover. The DWP said they would get something out, but with changes of government and whatnot, they haven't. And uh, we really would like to do some further research where we can track. And we did have one private agency interested in doing that. And we are still talking to them about could we track inquiries they get where people say we're disabled and see where it goes. So fair dues to them if that happens, because they're really opening their books to outside scrutiny in a sensitive area. And the last one, I think, um, Adam, have we made a difference? Well, we're here today. We have got this guide. It's um, on the Quorum site, Bath site. Practice note number 73 has got all this stuff in it. We had loads of, we had more publicity than anything I've ever done in 20 plus years as a researcher. Uh, but we haven't really seen it convert um, in the field yet. The conversation started and we hope it would carry on because if it doesn't, then this, this sad tale of lost opportunities will continue to be told. So Alison, before you go off to the panto, would you like to chip in anything else? Or has anybody got a question for Alison before you have to go out? Because any questions coming through? Or if people want to actually ask it on the mic, if that's all right, Adam, if you'd rather 